All right. So the point of this is to introduce you guys to um, reconstructed jets. Um, and I think it's going to take, um, it might take a couple of class periods to get through everything. Um, we're a little bit ahead in the class. So um, we have a little bit of time to spare. So this is designed to give you the basic information to understand jet spectra. Um, so some framework, um, when we're trying to do a measurement, this, I know this seems really basic, but it matters because jets are not a simple thing to measure. You wanna to, to try to ask, what are you trying to learn? What exactly are you measuring? Um, what assumptions are you making? What are the dominant uncertainties? And how do you compare to models? So, so with the first three to bring up um, and a relevant example, um, someone I know came to me and said, well, people who are vaccinated are three times as likely to end up in the hospital. I was going, this is not likely true. Um, and so then we talked about it. Well, what exactly was being measured of the people who are diagnosed with COVID? Um, how likely is it that someone will end up in the hospital? That was in this particular paper. And they said that, um, that so they came up with, so what they're really looking at is people who have taken COVID tests and tested positive for COVID who then end up in the hospital uh, vaccinated people were somewhat more likely to end up in that category, except that that was because people who are vaccinated are more likely to take get a COVID test if they're seriously ill than if they are not. So you have to think very carefully about what exactly the data that you're looking at measured. Um, another example from COVID is that people will look you know, in Israel, Israel has a really high percentage of people vaccinated. So um, people will say, ah, oh, well, but 50% of the people in the hospital are vaccinated. Vaccinated people are just as likely to end up hospitalized, hospitalized as unvaccinated people. Yeah, but if your vaccination rate is 90% of the population and 50% of the people in the hospital have COVID, have been back, who have in the hospital with COVID have been vaccinated, then actually clearly people who are vaccinated are less likely to end up in the hospital. And you know, if you had 100% of your population vaccinated, everybody in the hospital with COVID would be vaccinated. So you have to think very carefully about what exactly you're measuring. Um, and then if you wanna do a better measurement, you wanna think about what are the dominant uncertainties because you always wanna do better measurements, but if you have 10% uncertainties, it doesn't make sense to track down the 5% one and make that one smaller. And the reason we're in this class is the last bullet. How do you compare to models? What is the right way to compare to models? Um, and that's really important for jets because there are a lot of subtleties and you can easily accidentally be measuring something that you didn't think you were when you do jet measurements. Okay, so answers for jets are highly non-trivial. So we are going to start with the cartoon picture. Um, for those of you in the class, this is a little bit redundant, um, but I think that's, that's by construction. Um, so what we're trying to learn in, and, and it is, if you're not in the class, then, well, it's not as important, but hey, you're learning something new. Um, what we're trying to learn with jets in the four gluon plasma is basically use a probe, shine it through the medium, see how the probe is modified, and use that to determine the properties of the medium. So we want a probe which traveled through, um, through the medium that we created, but the quark gluon plasma is very short-lived, something like 1 to 10 Fermi over C, so you're talking about 10 to the negative 23 seconds. So you can't really shine something through the QGP. You really need to use something made in the QGP. So we use jets. And what happens when we form jets is that you have a quark or gluon 
in um, one nucleus scatter off of a quark or gluon in another nucleus. And you end up, most of the time, you end up with a back-to-back -back scattering of those two probes. Um, most of the time, sometimes you can end up with three outgoing particles, but that's very rare. Um, something like one in a thousand jets are from three jet events. Now, we expect the quark gluon pl plasma to be very dense and to um, modify the medium. So we expect it to absorb the probe significantly. And we see this. So here you can see one of the event displays. So this is from, well, it's kind of an event display. This is from the Atlas experiment. And um, what you can see is, I've drawn the coordinates. I, I did not redraw this. So um, this direction here um, is along the beam axis. And if you took this direction and curled it up around the detector, um, that's, this is the, this is what you get curling the, this part of it around the detector. And on the Z axis, this is the amount of energy deposited. So this is a peripheral heavy ion collision. And what you see is two back to back, um, what that means is two jets separated by about 180 degrees in azimuth or the angle around the beam pipe. So this is, most of these jets are produced like this, um, where they're 180, in pairs, 180 degrees apart. In heavy ion collisions, you will get one jet, but you don't see its partner jet. Or you sort of, what you can see here is sort of a warm spot, but you don't see a big tall tower that is as high as this one. And what was really fascinating was that when, um, when people started taking, when we did measurements at the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider, we measured jet quenching and we all were like, oh, yay, we got jet quenching. But we're sort of going, eh, we think we did it right, but we're not 100% certain that we made the right assumptions. And what was lovely when the LHC turned on was that, um, that we, um, you could see in my friends in Atlas and CMS could said that they could see on the event displays that you would have one very energetic jet that was clearly visible. An event display is when you look at the data um, on from the detector, you just are actively looking at the tracks reconstructed as you're taking the data. So they'd see one jet and they would not see its partner jet. So you could see jet punching right away. It was really cool. So that's what we're trying to see. And then we can go back to this simple example. Um, simple is in quotes for a reason, because it's not that simple, which is single hadron. So um, often we do these measurements um, and we're, we're after something colored because the quark gluon plasma mostly does not interact um, electromagnetically. And by the way, you guys can and should jump in with questions. Please stop me. Okay, so maybe let me pause. Any questions so far? Okay, I will continue, but I do want quest. I think this is review for the class. So I do expect questions when we get to the really hairy stuff. Okay, so. We want to try to quantify jet quenching. So we want something that gives us a number instead of just a hand wavy thing saying that jets are quenched. So the simplest thing that we can construct is something called the nuclear modification factor. Um, and this is basically you measure the number of particles as a function of the momentum. Usually we call that the number of particles as a function of momentum, a spectrum. And um, you divide the, that distribution in heavy ion collisions by the distribution in proton proton collisions. So, to steal a colleague's wording, hang on, Kristen.
to steal a colleague's wording, it's what you get out divided by what you put in. So if you have a nuclear modification factor of, um, of one, then you didn't lose any of your, you have, you didn't lose any particles. You have no jet quenching. You have exactly what you would expect to have. Um, so I want to go back and circle. You can write an equation for RAA or the nuclear modification factor. Um, and that is, this is what we call the spectrum. It's a little bit colloquial, um, but I will use it throughout class, so you might as well get used to it. Um, and that is just the distribution of the number of particles. So if you, um, you can just plot on a log scale, put dn, dp, t, the number of particles produced in the event, and you will get something which is roughly straight on a log scale. Um, and you take, and that's your numerator. The, the spectrum in heavy ion collisions is your numerator, and the spectrum in proton proton collisions scaled by the number of nucleon nucleon collisions you expected to have is the denominator. Okay. And now I have to clear my drawings. I don't have my tablet because my son has adopted it. Okay, so what you see is in heavy ion collisions. So here we've got a couple controls. And you guys, we went over this on Monday, so it's a little fresh, I hope. Um, so in if you look at an electromagnetic probe like the photons or the W or the Z you see a nuclear modification factor of one. If you look at um, the nuclear modification factor in proton lead collisions at high PT, you see that it is one. And we don't, we don't really look at low PT because it's complicated. So we're gonna just focus on the, the part that's easy to understand. So don't look here, because it's hard and messy. So at high PT, in proton lead collisions where we don't expect the PGP, you see a nuclear modification factor of one, no modification. And, or sorry, in proton lead collisions. And then in heavy ion collisions, you see significant suppression. So you see, um, so you see corp, um, you see jet quenching. Okay. So, this is, you know, this is what uh, in the, the Phoenix plot, this is from the Phoenix experiment. It's known as the t-shirt plot because it's all of the physics that Phoenix measured on um, in a plot you can put on a t-shirt. And of course, I actually did make a plot. I have a shirt with this on it um, because I am a geek. Um, and you see a whole bunch of different probes. So these guys here are photons and at the Large Hadron Collider, you have photons um, up here and then every other color is, uh, everything else is some type of colored probe. They're all hadrons. Um, colored mean, meaning that it is color charge. So you always see jet suppression if you look at any type of colored probe. Okay, so we've gotten this far and I've been telling you about jets. And I want to step back and say, what exactly am I measuring? What is the definition of a jet? And we're gonna start with proton-proton collisions, which is what you guys are all measuring because it's hard enough there. And everybody in the class is working on a proton-proton analysis. Um, so that's, why you're, what you're doing, but then it's a part of a project in heavy ion collision. So, okay, what is a jet? So if you ask this question, even as late as the 1980s, you would get an answer that you're measuring a parton. That is that a jet is a measurement of a quark or a gluon. 
Um, that was what people would try to do. They were trying to measure quarks and gluons. So you don't see quarks or gluons traveling through your detector because they are um, they are not stable. It's more energetically favorable to if you pull a quark and a quark pair apart. It's more energetically favorable to make another quark any quark pair than to pull them apart any further. At some point, they just snap and make new um, new hadrons instead of being able to pull them apart. So you will never see a quark in your detector directly. And so when you have this quark and I quark, um, if when you have a quark and an anti quark slowly move apart, it's going to make a shower of hadrons. So as you have these partons hit each other, a parton in one nucleus hits a parton in the other, as they travel apart, they are going to make a shower of hadrons. Okay, so this is what this looks like. This is another event display. So here, well, it's actually two event displays from two different um, experiments. So you have a dijet event in um, the STAR experiment at the relativistic heavy ion collider. So here you're looking down the beam pipe and perpendicular to that, you see two showers of particles in opposite directions. And you see something similar. This is a CMS event display. Um, and I, this looks like a proton-proton collision, but I don't see it. I could probably, oh, it was in October, so it was probably proton-proton. Um, so, here you see these towers are the amount of energy deposited in the calorimeter, and the lines are tracks. So what you see again is two back-to-back -back showers of particles. So that is qualitatively what a jet is. Let me take a let me pause for just a second and see where people are. Are you guys following? Yes, yes, I'm following. I feel like this is this is content that we saw in the videos, I think. Yes, yeah, I remember some redundant. of it. It's a little redundant. That's it's not going to be redundant anymore. But I wanted you to be that in agreement that far. Okay. So the really tricky question is like, how do you know if in principle, if you have a jet, if you add up all of the particles in the jet? You get at the energy of the parton. So you should be able to say how much energy did that quark have? And the problem is, where do you draw the line? So if you are trying to find your jet, um, do you draw it here and include all those particles, but not that one? Um, how do you know how many particles to include? Or um, you can actually, let me, I have to clear my annotations again. And it's not cooperative. All right. So I also could say, well, let's look at this side. Maybe this is one jet and that's one jet. So maybe I had one of these three jet events and maybe that blue particle Maybe these two are just something weird off to the side. And this one looks kind of like it's actually a two jet event because it was designed, it was pulled out of event displays to make it nice and neat. Um, but you actually have some interesting stuff going on in this CMS event where you have a lot of particles that don't look like they're part of the jet. And here, this the this jet is rather large. So where do you draw the line? And and when you get some of these events that are, if you get a lot of particles spread out, how do you know if you even have a jet? Where do you how do you know where to draw the jet? Um, which particles should you include? So um, the answer for the longest time for how you know. How do you know that you have a jet? Was I know it when I see it. Do any of you guys get the illusion? No. No, this was a famous Supreme Court um, case where they actually, it was a First Amendment case where they were deciding, um, so the deciding on what qualified as pornography. And so, Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart said he knows it when he sees it. 
And eventually that precedent fell. That is, um, that case was overturned because it was vague and it wasn't clear what was meant. So how could anyone know if they were breaking the law? Um, if it doesn't hold up, if it's if I know it when I see it isn't good enough in law, it's not good enough in science. So we have to have a, a better definition. So here, what you can see, um, what you can see over here is um, something called a Feynman diagram, and what it shows is a quark coming in and scattering off of an antiquark, and you would read time on this axis. So the quark and the antiquark hit, they create a virtual photon, and then they um, that virtual photon splits into a um, quark and then antiquark again. And then as they travel apart, they are color connected, meaning that they have to have color charges conserved as they spread apart. Um, and as they travel apart, they form first, uh, they first shower and create a whole bunch of different partons. That means quarks and gluons. And then they hadronize. So they form the final state particles that, which are mostly hadrons um, that actually hit your detector. So you have some ambiguity here. Where do you draw jet one? Where do you draw jet two? Um, but at least in principle, what you would be trying to do with this jet finding is add up all of the energy here and here so that you could have the energy of, of the, um, the quark and the anti-quark. And you can see here already, if you look at this Feynman diagram, should you read this as this quark hadronizes and makes a very large jet, or does it spit off a gluon, which then hadronizes, and then the quark hadronizes? Two or three jets, not clear. So what you had was all in the 90s, which I think was when you guys were mostly born. So. I feel old. Okay, you had uh, splitting and merging algorithms so that you would try to um, figure out if you had a jet, should you um, should you split that jet or should you um, merge it? And what you would ideally like, we say, um, if you're trying to measure partons, what we would ideally like is we say hadronic degrees of freedom are integrated out. And what people mean by that is that you don't want to be very sensitive to how your um, how your particle breaks up up into different hadrons, and the reason you don't want to be sensitive to that is because we don't have good models for it. It's all um, phenomenological models. So if you're sensitive to it, you're sensitive to something that you can't calculate very well. So it's very hard to make meaningful comparisons between theory and experiment if you're sensitive to exactly which and how many hadrons something breaks into. Um, we also look for something called infrared and collinear safety. Um, so collinear safety um, is shown, there's a schematic diagram here. It turns out that in the theory we use to calculate this called quantum thermodynamics, it is really, really hard to calculate um, when these quarks or gluons split into two particles that are collinear, meaning traveling in the same direction. So if you have a quark traveling along a five, let's say you have a 50 GeV quark and it spits off 25 GeV gluon going in the same direction. So now you have 22, 25 GeV um, particles. It's very difficult for our theorists oops, to actually calculate that. So the reason we don't want to be sensitive to that is then that our theorists can't measure it. So a lot of these early jet finding algorithms were seeded cone algorithms. And what they might do is something like, let's look at a, every two GeV particle and we're gonna draw a cone around it. And that's what we're gonna start with for our jets. So a seeded cone algorithm is explicitly not collinear safe because you're very sensitive to, so if you had a 4G, if you had a three point, 
eight GeV hadron and it split off into two 1.7 GeV particles and you had a two GeV threshold and a seeded cone algorithm, you would not find that jet. And your theory would not be able to calculate that well, so you would not be able to make a robust comparison to theory. Um, infrared um, safety means that uh, you really want, so if you, for instance, allow jets to, particles to be in multiple jets, you can get an infinite number of jets at low momentum. So it turns out that your theory is also, theory predicts that it's very easy to make a bunch of very soft, low energy, meaning low energy particles. And you're very bad at calculating how many of them you have. So it's always allowed to make a one MeV um, gluon as you're fragmenting. Um, but it's very hard to calculate how many of those you actually made. And if you have a lot of soft particles with, or you allow particles to be in multiple jets, your number of jets will go to infinity as you go to low energies. And that does not make any sense. So we look for infrared safety and for linear safety. Um, and then, and what they agreed upon in the 1990s was something called the Snow Mass Accord, um, which says basically, theoretical calculations and experimental measurements should use the same jet finding algorithm. So what, um, it doesn't matter what you're trying to measure, you should do the same thing in theory and the experiment. And you now see I'm mentioning this thing called a jet finding algorithm. Um, it, I'm not talking about a parton in this definition. Um, I'm just saying jet finding algorithm. And so you have this jet finder that groups final state particles into jet candidates. That's all it does. And it's detached from the concept of a parton. Now, it still has something to do with partons, something to do with, this, with the spectrum of quarks and gluons, but it's not exactly that because it turns out that it's really hard to define even theoretically how many quarks and gluons you have. So here is schematically what a jet finding algorithm does. Um, it takes, if you're talking about measurements, it's going to take tracks that you measured and clusters in a calorimeter. You dump them in your jet finding algorithm and it gives you out jet candidates. If you have a, a model, you put particles in, put them in a jet finding algorithm, you get jet candidates. Now, I'm being very, you'll notice that I use the phrase jet candidates. Um, I like that phrase best because I'm not making a value judgment about whether or not it is a um, whether or not it is a real jet. Um, and this is what you use. You use the same jet finding algorithm. This green box has to be the same in theory and experiment. Um, in principle, if it's infrared safe and collinear safe, does not really matter. Um, what it is, the two should be comparable as long as you as you do the same. And I want to point out the output is only as good as the input. So we, we talk a lot about infrared and collinear safe. I talked about infrared and collinear safe, but a lot of experiments actually have lower thresholds on what goes into the measurement. And so if you can only do like CMS mostly does tracking below uh, above 500 MeV. So um, basically all CMS measurements, and that, that's because they have a very large magnetic field and they can't do tracking well below that. So um, all CMS measurements are going to have a lower momentum threshold of something around 500 MV. It turns out you can go a little bit lower than that, but um, that probably doesn't matter if you're talking about a one TeV jet. Um, but it does start to matter if you're talking about a uh, 10 GeV jet. So a lot of times you have these thresholds, which um, 
when you're listening to talks, for instance, well, you most of you guys won't be listening to technical talks in, in the field, um, but if you listen to technical talks in the field, people won't always highlight that they have these pets, but they do. Um, and yeah, so the output is only as good as the input. Now there's actually a suite of different jet finding algorithms. There are basically exactly four algorithms, which are infrared and collinear safe. And um, they're in a lovely package called FastJet. Um, which also takes advantage of all sorts of um, fancy computational algorithms so that you can do jet finding quickly. Because it, if you do jet finding in a dumb way, then the, the time the calculation takes goes like the square of the number of particles. And that's really, really, that can be really slow in a heavy ion collision with, you know, 4,000 particles in a central collision. So uh, you, you, you are not going to, you are unlikely to come up with a fancy clever jet finding algorithm that is infrared or collinear safe if someone does not already. Um, so the first one is called the KT algorithm. And it is what we call a sequential combination algorithm. And so you calculate for every pair of particles, well, you calculate um, for every, sorry, for every pair, yeah, every pair of particles, you calculate this minimum quantity DIJ, which is a measure of how close they are. Um, and you also calculate its DIV, which is for the particle alone. And you combine the smallest one. And um, if this one is, if a DIV is the smallest, this becomes a jet candidate. And you repeat this until you have all of the particles clustered into jets. So all particles are in a jet candidate. And so what you will see is that no matter where your particles are, um, they are getting clustered into a jet candidate. Um, and you can find the area of the jet candidate. You put what we call ghost particles in. So you will throw in a bunch of say 100 MeV particles and see which jet those one, or sorry, one MeV particles and see where they get clustered. And what you see is that the KT jet finding algorithm makes very weird shapes. They are not circular. Um, the KT jet finding algorithm, because if you look at this definition of the distance measure, it is larger for larger momentum particles. So the KT jet finding algorithm starts with all sorts of, starts with the softest particles and then moves up in momentum as it clusters. Um, the anti-KT jet finding algorithm changes the exponent in this distance measure. Um, and it therefore starts at the high momentum particles and works its way down. For this reason, the anti-KT jet finding algorithm is used in most heavy ion collision measurements um, because you're in principle less sensitive to background. You're starting at the high momentum stuff and working your way down, but there's also some um, computational reasons that uh, the anti-KT jet finding algorithm, it turns out you can calculate all of the, the jets faster than you can with the KT jet finding algorithm, specifically because it starts at high PT and starts throwing that stuff into jets first. So you're working from the stuff that is more jet-like down as opposed to working from the stuff that is more background-like up. And the cambridge aachen algorithm uses an exponent of zero, which basically means that it looks at how far apart the two particles are um, in azimuth and pseudorapidity. The pseudorapidity or rapidity is the distance along the beam pipe. Um, and so that's, those are the most common jet finding algorithms. There are slightly different applications for each of them that um, I will, I, 
I will gladly answer questions if you are curious, but the big point is that the jet finding algorithm is basically feeding it. You put in particles, it gives you out jet jets or jet candidates. So as to the question of what is a jet, a jet is what a jet finder finds. So a jet has nothing to do with a parton. Well, it has, let me say, it, it's not that it has nothing to do with a parton. You are not measuring a parton. You cannot and should not go into your simulation and say, this is a quark. Let me see if my jet has all of the, let me compare the energy of my jet to the energy of my quark and use that to measure whether my jet finder is doing what it should. No, the jet as an object is whatever it gets clustered into a jet by the jet finder. So we started with this concept of a parton, but in principle, independent of whether or not you had a parton, the jet finder is going to cluster all cluster particles into um, jet candidates. It's going to cluster all particles into a jet candidate, candidate, even if it had nothing to do with what we would call a jet. So everything, everything is in a jet candidate. Now, when you do this, you can actually make some very good comparisons to models. Um, and it seems like our models are very well under control. So this is actually a paper that one of the people in the class is implementing in Divot. Um, this shows the cross section. So this is a normalized number of jets per event as a function of momentum. And uh, the black points show the data and the different, um, oh, sorry, the different shaded bands show different calculations. We use a model called um, perturbative quantum, well, quantum chromodynamics. And we calculate it using perturbative quantum chromodynamics, um, which is basically to say we take a Taylor series. Um, and the green and the pink show what you get if you only calculate to the parton level, so not including the formation of final state, um, pion scans, protons, and other hadrons. What you see is that in general, um, the parton level calculations overestimate the data, although the error band on the green calculation is very large. And what the blue has is, um, this, it's the same as the pink, but it has a hadronization um, implementation. So then you see that with a reasonable approximation of hadronization, this agrees very well. Now, I told you that you do not want to be sensitive to hadronization. We might not, there's a few reasons why this is going on. First of all, that was an ideal scenario and real life is messy and you actually are somewhat sensitive to hadronization. Second of all, each jet finder has what's called a resolution parameter. And I'm, gonna use, I'm using resolution parameter and not radius, specifically because it's not the same thing as radius. Um, but that tells, that is, you can qualitatively think of it as like radius. So that tells you the size of the jet. Now this is an anti-KT jet. So we can go back to the anti-KT jet finding algorithm. And this algorithm virtually always makes circular jets about high, well, the high momentum jets are circular, although it can make funny shaped jets where they overlap. So, but a jet that's far away from anything else is gonna be a circular jet. So for the anti-KT algorithm, which is what all of your papers use, they are mostly circular jets. And you can think of this resolution parameter as approximately like the radius of the jet. So an R, a resolution parameter of 0.2 is rather small. Most particle physics studies, if they're trying to measure jet spectra, they like to go out to at least 0.5 and they really prefer going out to one. Um, and it depends on the application. Sometimes in particle physics, 
experiments. They're trying to identify what they're trying to increase the probability that the jet was from a heavy flavor cork or something like that. And they might use look at a narrower jet because of that. Um, so here, because these jets are rather small, you are actually more sensitive to hadronization. And you can understand that because if you have your quarks and gluons in your jet, and then you're breaking them apart into hadrons, if you have a small jet, it's more likely that that process is going to sweep stuff in and out of the acceptance of the jet cone. So it's going to change the amount of energy. But overall, the message here is that the theory is pretty good. Um, and here you can see the ratio of different sizes of jets, and this is the same message. So this is the smaller, um, the number of smaller jets in the numerator and larger jets in the denominator. And this is particularly sensitive to hadronization. And if you have a decent model, your model can describe it fairly well. Um, so the model is fairly well understood in proton proton collisions. Well, I should say model. This is this is a solid theory. Um, we trust we trust quantum chromodynamics, but we don't always trust our calculations of it because calculating anything in quantum chromodynamics is hard. Okay, so this is my mini summary. And this is a good place to stop for the day as well, even though we're a few minutes early. Jets are not partons. So, and especially for our particle physicists in the room, if anybody is telling you that when you calculated, that when you measure a jet, that you actually, that you've measured a quark or a gluon, they do not understand jets. Um, jets are loosely related to partons, but you're not measuring a parton. A jet is defined by its jet finder and whatever parameters it is. The primary parameter is its um, radius. You need infrared safety and collinear safety. These are the four infrared and collinear safe um, algorithms on the market. You could arguably say some things like a Gaussian filter are poss probably infrared and collinear safe, but there's a number of downsides of those too. Um, I did not go over the second to last point because it's complicated, but the last one, there's generally good theory, good agreement between theory and experiment. Now, for those of you in the class, you don't, well, you don't necessarily need a deep understanding of jets. You're going to run the jet finder. You're going to trust that Antonio and I are telling you to put the right particles into the jet finder. Well, let me come back to that. You're going to put the particles Antonio and I tell you to put into the jet finder in, and then your jet candidates out of that are what go into your spectrum. One of the reasons we're focusing on reconstructed jet measurements this semester is because I had a student over the summer who tried to do a different jet measurement in proton-proton collisions and was not able to reproduce the theory calculations in the paper. And we think that it had to do with which particles went into the jet finder. And we want to do some additional cross checks and make sure we understand. So we're doing it on papers this time with people who are still in the field and still alive, which helps. Okay, so let me stop with content there and see if there are questions because we're going to stop with this content for the day. No questions? This is just a lot to take in. So it's taking me some time to digest. Okay, that I can that I understand. Mostly you guys are just gonna use you can use the jet finder as a black box. 
that's okay for this class. If you were my graduate student, I would be reminding you throughout that jets are not partons. Antonio, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I think that sounds great. All right, I'm going to stop the recording.